is a uh, product of this congregation. We discovered him serving pizza right next door. I think it's important we did him over there because rather than being a mediocre pizza server, He is now at par and excellence server of the bread of life. And we certainly are pretty far that. His parents, uh, Gene and Joy, are back there in the back, and I know they're very proud of him, as we are. And I wish it were so that other graduates of the Spring Bible Institute, of which he is a alumni, were as dedicated to the truth as Jeff is. And fortunately, everyone has to make a choice as to whether they will, in fact, stand for the old Jerusalem gospel, and some have not done so. So we're very appreciative of Jeff and his stand for the truth. He is to a Cree, uh, the former uh, Shaw, Cree Shaw, $3.00. Lorelai, Liliana, and Macaria, and he's presently preaching for the church in De Leon, and he will be reviewing a book for us, which I think is important for us to uh, always have someone to examine these books, and it's the book by Rick Atchley called Together Again, so I know you'll uh, look forward to Jeff as I do also. Jeff can speak to us. My wife equipped me with pictures of the kids, so if you want to see them, here. She's a good wife. I'm thankful to be here today. I want to let you know how much I appreciate the Spring Church of Christ. I hope that you appreciate this congregation and all the good work they do. They care for each other. They love lost souls. They love the truth. And what more could be said? These elders, as I was here and a member, spent time personally investing in me and my spiritual growth and uh, David took many Sundays and Monday nights and fielded phone call hours of the night answering strange Bible questions and uh, I very much appreciate him for that. It's customary to thank the people who are letting you stay with them if you go to the ship and since I'm staying with my parents I'm not going to thank them for allowing me to stay there but what I am going to do do is thank them for not killing me when I was a teacher, <laughs> and we'll just leave it at that and see what happens. <laughs> I'd like you to bear with me, maybe humor me a bit for just a couple minutes. I like all the men in the room, when I count to three, to say the name of your wife. One, two, three. Three, Korean. Now what you heard was a sound that cannot be distinguished. You couldn't really pick out many, if any, names. And if you could, they were different names than probably the ones that you pronounced. Now, when I count to three, I want you to name the wife, spouse, of Bill Clinton. One, two, three. Well, that didn't work like it was supposed to, but <laughs> it was closer to being understood. In the book, Together Again, there is an account at the end of Southeast's What We Believe class. Bob, that's Bob Russell, one of the authors. Bob often has people call out at the same time the denominational or religious background in which they were raised. It is a dissonant sound. When dozens of people shout out at the same time, Catholic, Presbyterian, Christian Church, Baptist, or even Muslim, Buddhist, or atheist, then Bob asked them to shout out the Jesus, then just whisper together the name of Jesus. Can you imagine the sounds of harmony when they say Christ's name in unity? Isn't that sweet? 
Well, I don't really know all that, that means. As I study my Bible, I did learn something. Is that when the blind lead the blind, they shall call on a witch. So you take that for what it's worth. Move on. Such is the kind of wisdom that you get from reading this book. That's about as far as you. In 2005 in Stephenville, Texas, excuse me, in 2005 in Stephenville, Texas, Leroy Eric came to speak at the Graham Street Church of Christ. And I went to that meeting where he spoke of there, and his gig was to come in wearing a coon hat and pretend to be Raccoon John Smith. He did an impersonation. And the first thing he said as he began his, whatever you'd like to call it, was, if it weren't for me, none of you would be here. And then he went on to elaborate, saying, what I mean is, Church of Christ would not exist as we remember he's impersonating Raccoon John Smith. With those words, he laid doctrine. This was not just a narrative. It was not just a dramatic interpretation of some man's biography. He was trying to teach something, and he was trying to lay down a principle upon which he could build his own false doctrines. And he did that successfully, and liberals continue to use the exact same tactic to this very day. What did he do? Well, in the context of that, lesson he went on to say he went on to say if the church of Christ must die to preserve Christian unity then let it die hallelujah it's because he believes that the restoration movement as he terms it is bigger and better than the church of Christ he believes that it's more important than the blood bought body of Christ he believes that it is the most important spiritual institution on the earth. In the cover of this book, Together Again, you read a groundbreaking book in that the two leading ministers from different sides of the aisle call for reconciliation of the churches after a century of separation. They show love and urging it is time to stand united Declare that we are brothers, forget the past, and move forward. What he was saying when he opened up with those statements, that is Leroy Garrett in the previous, in the previous lecture that I was speaking of, what he was saying was this, that the church is equal to the restoration movement. Now, I want you to understand that when he makes that assertion, he substitutes the restoration movement for the restoration concept. If we're having a history class about occurrences in history, you want to say restoration movement, fine, have a field day with it. But when we're talking about biblical Christianity, we need to be talking about the restoration concept and not about glamorizing the restoration movement because there's nothing there that needs to be glamorized as a point of faith or a point of doctrine. It's just stuff that happened. I'm thankful for many of the things that, that were accomplished by, by those men. I'm also ashamed of some of the things that were done by those men. And all of us ought to be. But they are laying down a principle that the restoration movement is all about and not about the blood-bought church of Christ, the one that bears his name. And that's what this book capitalizes on all through. When Leroy Garrett came in and delivered that lesson, that opening, those opening remarks, he betrayed the restoration ideal. He betrayed the restoration concept. He was attempting to put it to death so that he could move on with his own doctrines. There's a bit setting a book like this. And the first time I read this, I thought, oh no, what am I going to write about? What am I going to speak about, I couldn't find anything to say about this book. I'm not even sure what it was saying. I'm not even sure if I had complete sentences read, which is an improper construction. You know, I've got a preposition at the end, but that's what happens when you read stuff like this. 
I had to read it several more times and finally I started to catch on that this book is not about proposing a basis upon which we could get instrumental music in the church. It's not defending the doctrine of that they hold about worship. It's not about giving positive, real positive reasons and substantial reasons that we can have unity with the Christian church. It's not about that. What it's about is confounding us. It's about taking the apprehensive members in the churches where these liberals are and equipping them to have conversations with us so that they can get out without, without being turned around or converted to the truth. That's what it's about. Because no matter what, you mark it down, they want their instrumental music and they are going to have their instrumental music. That's all that there is to it. They don't care what the Bible says. This book is not about tearing down walls. It's about sweeping foundations. Because they've done the damage. They're just trying to start something new on their own and they don't want anyone who's going to oppose them and they're trying to give everything that stands in the way. That's what this book is about. I said it's scary to read a book like that. You know, candy will rot your teeth. I can testify to that. TV will brain. I'm guilty of that. Books like this will, will rot your soul. And we need to be warning people about those. Was it Brother Brad Green did a, a good, a, an excellent job at reviewing I Just Want to Be a Christian. And we need, need to be aware of the ways that work. I did something when I was watching TV, though. I used to like to watch cartoons, and one of the cartoons was Foghorn Leghorn, and I don't know if you remember him, but there was an episode where he was to learn the little chicken hawk, and at one point he was going to teach him baseball, and he said two things which influenced me. Number one, he said, listen up here, son, and that got my attention. And number two, that you've got to keep your eye on the ball, and when you're reading a book like this, that's exactly what you've got to do. You have to keep your on the ball. Because they don't come out and say just what they're trying to accomplish. It's sort of laced through the book in undertones. And that's what we're going to look at for the first part of this lesson. Let's look at a few assumptions in this book. The first of those I've already mentioned. I'm turning to page number 20, just if you happen to be taking this. And that is that the church is the product. Now understand, the church is the product of the restoration movement. And that's false. He said that they had a special guest from the appellate side of our movement. There is no our movement on the appellate side. That's not the way it works. There is the church. It's separate and distinct from that movement. And this is the way that they assume these things. The purpose statement on page 34 is stopped short. Excuse me, I got away from Houston and got used to clean air and you come back and it will kill you. He says this book is an effort to explain why we believe the two groups who trace their hit the restoration movement and still believe in its principles should be unified. We've documented key areas of agreement between the two groups and practical ideas for steps toward union in hopes that members of both sides will begin working together for the cause of Christ. They didn't go back far enough when they were trying to find something upon which to base their actions. They said, let's look back in history and find some sort of foundation for the way that we conduct ourselves and the way that we organize our institutions. And you know where they stopped? They stopped with the beginning of this historical movement when they should have gone back to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. That's where they should have gone. And they should have fought what happened there and continued steadfastly in the apostles. But that's not what they do. What they do is they turn back and they go to look for out what Alexander Campbell or Barton Stone said. And these guys, I guarantee you, at least Leroy Garrett knows a lot more about Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, than I do. 
You know why you have to keep your eye on the ball? Because the first time I read this, I got out all the volumes of Search for the Ancient Order I had, and I got out Z.T. Sweeney's New Testament Christianity, got all the old tracts, and got on the Restoration Movement page. And, you know, I looked through that stuff, found a lot of interesting things, wasted several days. It occurred to me, this is nonsense. I didn't keep my eye on the ball, and I'm up swinging at curves. And that's, that's not the way that you deal with people like this. Listen, Proverbs 26 verse says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You know what? Me, Barton Stone was a heretic. I'm not going to get into the discussion. But if he was, and he wanted a piano, and he wanted to be the one playing it, so what? So what? What matters is what the New Testament teaches about instrumental music and fellowship missionary societies, and the entirety of the doctrine of Christ. That's what really matters. But these people think that the race of movement is all that there is, and it is the most important thing to be coveted and protected. You look through this. This is important. On pages 26 and 27, when I saw this, it just shocked me. It says, the movement had a simple plea, let us unite on Jesus and his word. Well, that starts off okay. We are not the only Christians. It's not okay, they said, but Christians only. They rejected creeds and denominational names, believing that such things cause division in the body of Christ. Where the Bible speaks, we will speak, they said. And where the Bible is silent, we will be silent. They were convinced that these simple propositions could transform, listen to that word, transform a divided Christianity into a united church. Now, see something that Christianity was operational in America at that time, and all it did was a transformation. Do you understand what he's saying here? Listen, to go on, he says, deciding to embrace the restoration ideal and be Christians only, followers call themselves Christians or disciples of Christ, and churches change their names to Christian Church or Church of Christ. Now, here's where he gets, gets on it. He says, was the Restoration Movement successful? One historian described the beginning of the Restoration Movement as the boldest Protestant Reformation since the time of Martin Luther. In other words, they view restoration as a method of reformation. The Reformation happened over in Europe way back when. That was a different historical movement. The Restoration is a method of reformation. Their take church was in as an exist and it needs a tune-up job and they say, we got the tune-up job, we're going to call it restoration. And then we're going to build something out, tune-up job, called the restoration movement. And that's going to be the thing that we love more than anything else and that's what we're going to follow. That's what this book teaches all through it. That's the basis for their unity with the Christian church, not the blood of Christ. That's why they have a problem with fellowship. You understand how closely connected everybody is made out of Christ to fellowship and all this? In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if, if that's a conditional statement, if in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, then what? That's where the blood comes in. In 2 John 9 through 11, is there blood in there? Of course there is. You don't have the blood of Christ where you do not have the doctrine of Christ. You do not have the blood of Christ where you have the church of Christ. And you have the church of Christ where you have the identifying marks. Not an affiliated historical movement that men have an affection for. That's not the church of Christ. Jesus Christ died and shed his blood so the covenant could have power power to remit sins. And it doesn't matter what Alexander Campbell did or didn't do, that power is still in the blood of Christ. Now, watch this. Later on, talking about baptism for the remission of sins, they, in this conviction, we have in the mainstream of historic Christian orthodoxy, the Nicene Creed still repeated in the worship services of the churches all around around the globe, there's one baptism for the remission of sins. Martin Luther's catechism says that baptism is forgiveness of sins. The Westminster Confession calls baptism a sign, a seal of forgiveness of sins. And of
not the walkers. What they're doing here is they're talking about baptism, and they're saying this is something we have in common with the Christian church, and we know that it's good because it's in this tradition. That's what they are saying. They're holding this Reformation tradition as authoritative and a reason to unify with the Christian church. What is the next step? Well, you know, we can unite with Lorenz too. We can unite with anybody so long as they have something that they call baptism. And we'll get more into why they do that later. Go in, you look at what else they say. And they refer to the vision of fathers. I can imagine the vision of our restoration forefathers being restored and the prayer of Jesus being fulfilled. Now, first off, they put the restoration fathers before they did Jesus Christ being fulfilled. That's what they're interested in. You say, you misrepresented them. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to elevate the restoration fathers over them fulfilling. What Rick Ashley and Bob Russell really is, the two are equal. That's really what he's getting at. If you read their books, you'll find out it is true. That's what they believe. Now, the growth of the movement, the restoration movement, has been experiencing phenomenal growth over the past 15 years on page 5 of the book. The restoration movement doesn't experience growth. The church experienced growth. The restoration movement is not the church. That's not what we're fighting for. And that's not what we're about and what we're members of. That's not what the Lord added us to when we obeyed from that form of doctrine He delivered us. And that's why it's right, because he delivered it, not because the Westminster Confession says this is part of Christian orthodoxy in the Reformation. I don't care about all that. And I don't want that kind of garbage denominationalism. I want the church for which my Lord died. There is a, another dangerous fallacy in all of this, and it's the idea, this rhetoric, that we unify on the cross of liberal definitions now. Now, first off, let me say this. The cross concept is valid, and what I mean by that is that when we talk about doing all things for the cross or living by the cross or if we've got uh, the principles of the cross, decent terminology, we learn it. In, in Galatians 6 and verse 4, it's supposed to glory only in the cross. But I want you to understand, here's why it's senseless rhetoric when Rick actually uses it. Because when he talks about unifying at the cross, he's talking about exclusively the, the beams made out of wood. That's what he's talking about. He's talk, simply talking about the events surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. That's it, and that's the sum total of Christianity. Now, what meaning? Does that have in anybody's life if you don't bring some applicant to that? Biblically, that's not what we're talking about when we say the cross of Christ. You learn also that that's not the exclusion. When we talk about the cross of Christ, we cannot use that terminology to the exclusion of the rest of the New Testament. Now listen, somebody says the words glory and the cross, we are. 6 and 14 says that. But we're also the glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 31. We're supposed to glory in the ministration of the Spirit. What is that talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8? Paul said, I glory in infirmities. Why does he have those infirmities coming upon him other than living out of the Christian life? Did he leave back there at the cross? It talks about him following the New Testament pattern and not compromising different points to get along with different people. That's what he's talking about. And he has these infirmities, problems. Well, not specifically out of that passage, but others that terminology into it. He carries in infirmities. What I'm saying is this. When we talk about the Christ, we are not limiting it to just sitting there, looking up at the cross where Jesus Christ died. We're talking about a broader concept which embraces all of the doctrine contained in the New Testament. And Brother Lester pointed that out. There is no difference between the gospel and the doctrine. They are one and the same. We talk about things, list sin in First chapter 1 and verse 10. And it says other things contrary to the gospel. Can you preach against sin and preach the gospel? Yes, you can. Yeah, but that's not the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That was the gospel. Well, that's part of the gospel, but that's not all that there is to it. Listen, 
the cross concept embraces the biblical doctrine. And I want you to see how this works as these liberals use that terminology. The liberal cross concept, it excludes some, if not most, doctrines. It depends on who you ask. Concerning tolerance, on page of the book, people criticize that message as an intolerant faith. The death and resurrection, I, I don't know why he includes the resurrection when he tries to cross. As far as I understand, Christ was not resurrected on the cross. We'll let that go. The death and resurrection of Jesus were the greatest acts of tolerance in human history. It is by God's grace that we are saved. And then he goes on another quote, page 52. However, at times we are saved by preaching our pet doctrines rather than the cross of Christ. He goes on to quote ACU Professor Saying, While these scholars from church affirm and practice a cappella worship, they rightly contend that it is at the crux of things. Its practice is not tied to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. They cannot prove that. They cannot prove that singing and singing alone in worship is not tied to the cross of Christ. Now, I want you to follow along with me for a minute. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14, there's a fundamental principle that the people who read that book were expected to know, and it's this. Silence has a prohibitive nature. Go back and find where it says, Shout not, priest, if you're from Judah. You can't find it in your Old Testament. There is not, shout not, there is not an explicit prohibitive statement. The people who read that book were expected to understand that. You go on through the Hebrews, and you see that Moses was charged with making the tabernacle and all its instruments. That's true. Not only was he charged with making them, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, he was charged with making them according to the pattern. Why was he charged with making them according to the pattern? Here's why. Because they symbolize, they are types of heavenly things. Moses, what do those heavenly things look like? The only way he knew what they looked like if he made the physical things, if the physical things according to the pattern, that's the only way that he could gain any kind of understanding as to what actually was in heaven. He didn't have insight specifically as to what was there unless he could look first at, at the pattern that was given to him. You understand what I'm saying here is that he would have violated the theology if he went out, outside of that pattern. Rather, if he had gone outside of the pattern, he would have been presumptuous. If we go outside the pattern, what are we violating? Well, you know what? The point is I don't know. I don't know what I'm violating when I go outside of the pattern. But God does. And here's something that I guarantee is that he will hold me accountable for it if I go outside the pattern, just like he would hold us accountable for it. If he went outside the pattern, now go through and you look at the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, the Bible says, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 2, the Bible says, apparently the first covenant, you're talking about the covenant now, had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first where it was a candlestick and a table and a showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark oven and overlaid round about with gold, where it was the golden pot that had manna and so on, down to the tables of the covenant. These are the things we're talking about. We're talking about the covenant. And we're talking about his relationship to that old covenant. Now, you've got to keep your eye on the ball. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 says, And for this cause, what cause was that? Keep your eye on the ball. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, we have a contrast to the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it pertains to the death of Christ. Where did Christ? He died on the cross. We're talking about the covenant. Grace is more than just his death, and his death gave me the rest of the covenant. His blood was shed death. That's where this comes in. And this pertains 
to our worship. If we go to tamper with turn, we're tampering with covenant. If we're tampering with the covenant, we're showing our disrespect for the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, the Hebrews were told that they needed to move on past the first principles. If Gatsley would take a little bit of time and study his Bible, he would learn that we must only do those things which are authorized by the New Testament of Jesus Christ. He would stop writing garbage like this. Well, we'll damn souls to hell if they believe it. Now, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, he encourages those not to forsake the worship assembly. Hebrews chapter 11, he goes on to talk about the living this faith, this faith that is exempt in the covenant, which is in the covenant. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, we get right back down to matters of worship. And you know what God did when Cain violated that pattern? He violated the pattern. You know how I know his pattern? Here's how. It's because Abel worshiped by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God delivered it. He delivered a pattern. God is no respecter of persons. Cain had access to the same things that Abel did. He had access to the same work. He had access to the same pattern for worship. And these things pertain to worship. You want to live by faith? You want to show what it means when you understand how important the blood of Christ is and that, that covenant for which he shed his blood? Then you will understand what the cross of Christ really means. And you'll say, let's, you'll quit saying, let's go sit down at the cross and forget about the rest of the Christian faith. Because that's not sense. This is the cross fallacy. If you read a book like you have got to keep your eye on the ball because this is the garbage that they try to feed you. And it will rot souls. Here is another problem that you have in a book like this. Let me turn to page 37 and read this account. And it's occurred to me I'm nowhere near getting through the material that I have. But there's more in the book and I encourage you to read it. A preacher in our movement once spoke to a minister's meeting where Bob was in attendance. The preacher dogmatically attempted to prove why all the ministers present were wrong on certain doctrines. When it was finished, there was an awkward silence. Bob finally said, I get the impression that you believe everyone, everyone would just put aside their preconceived ideas and take the Bible for what it is. We'd all agree with everything you just said. Now, Brent, here's something I want to do to encourage you real quick. That question that Bob Russell asked this man was designed to intimidate him. And you have no reason to intimidate it. You've got the blood of Jesus Christ behind you. Are you embarrassed to say yes? Because that's what the Bible teaches. I tell you, I've stopped saying yes, though. You know what I'm saying? A little question. If it were true, would you? Because I'm not going to go any further until you answer that question. But this is the question put to them, and he said, that's right. And I believe that this man said so out of love. I have no reason to believe otherwise. I believe that he said it out of compassion, concern for the souls at that meeting. Because it definitely wasn't easy standing up in front of some of these people and saying those things, but he did it because he cared about the doctrine of Christ. And he cared about the cross of Christ, and he cared about the pattern. But listen, what the response of Bob Russell was, he says, how arrogant of us believe that we alone have a handle on the right doctrine. He says that that's arrogance. Now listen to what happened. Listen to the question he asked. He said, if we would put down our preconceived notions, putting down your preconceived notions, is that an act of humility? Arrogance. I'm having trouble figuring that one out. Bob Russell has it figured out. He says, when you put down your preconceived notions, that's an act of arrogance. Don't do that. You hang on to your preconceived notions, and here's what you do. You conclude that God is not intelligent enough to create a, a lesson, a message, a Bible, a New Testament, a fire word, a covenant. He's not intelligent enough to create his, his word so that man can understand it. Which is more arrogant. I believe God is powerful enough to give his word in a way that we can understand. You know what Bob Russell expected to be understood? He thinks he's smarter than God. That's the way these people think. And that's the way they will talk to you if you get engaged in discussions with them. They will talk down to you. I don't like that. No, I like that because, I'll tell you why, because man is creating the image of God. 
which if he said, that's not what I teach at all, well, then he teaches that God create, couldn't create man in his image intelligent enough to understand his word. Which is it? think that I'm a total imbecile, or do you think that God is stupid? You pick, because that's the implication of these doctrines. Listen, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the Bible says the secret things belong to God. And everybody says, see, we can't really know whether or not we can use instrumental music or not. No, we do know because it's not a secret. The mystery has been revealed. And Paul wrote it down in a few words. And when you read it, you may understand. If you don't think that you can understand, you call a liar. And you call the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to write those things a liar. You call God a liar after you're done saying that he's not smart enough to get his point across. This is the kind of thing you read when you read these books. Isaiah 55, 6 through 11, you read about God's ways being higher than man's ways. But the point isn't that we can't understand his ways. It just means that we wouldn't have thought him up and thank him that he chose to reveal them to us. And he says going to come down like the rain, not only are they going to come down like the rain, but they're not going to return void. What's that mean, brethren? It means they're going to accomplish their purpose. If God purposed that men understand his word, it's understandable. Otherwise, Isaiah 55 should be ripped out of your Bibles today. I'm so sorry I have to skip this material. But I want to get this in, and I'll make it brief. I want to get this in because it pertains to so many other things. This chapter title of the book is a common something, a common plea, a common savior, a common gospel, a common mission, and so on, a common bond. And throughout the book, there is an appeal to an argument from commonality. That's what I termed it. I don't know anybody else has ever termed it something. They're so informed me. I'm glad to hear. It's the often common out. What it says is this. You focus on the positive. You focus on the things that we have in common. If after services tonight, I were to go outside and start swinging around in the tree and misbehaving like the other kid, and Brother Kent Bailey were to come up and say, you shouldn't be doing that, and I'm going to place you under arrest, and he's going to, you know, he's going to place me in the zoo, in the monkey cage, I would protest a little bit about that. I wouldn't like that, Kent. And Kent would say, you know what, you're right. You don't belong in that. You're, you're creating an image of God. And Bob Russell and Rick Ashley would come along and say, now wait a second. Now. Why are we focusing on the differences? Those are the things that divide us. Why don't we focus on the things that we have in common? Look, look Jeff and the monkeys, they have opposable ones. They both breathe air. They're both ugly. <laughs> Let's focus on the things that we have in common. Doesn't make me a monkey. Listen, with the exception of Johnny, might not be this way in San Francisco, but with the exception of Montrose, if a man was to walk into a woman's restroom, he would be arrested. He could say, look at the things that we have in common. But that doesn't make him a woman. And if I go out here in this world and I look at all the denominations and I say, look at the things that we have in common with them, that does not make them a Christian. It's the things that, different, that make a difference. I had to get this in because it scares me to death to listen to brethren that I knew that were sound, that were sound, excuse me, I gave an uncertain sound. Brethren, I know that were sound that are now using this argument from commonality to get along with people who are walking in ways of wickedness. And you know what they do? They cause people to err by their lightness the ultimate prophets did when they told lies. And that's what the argument from commonality is. And I don't care how much I have in common with all of these institutes. I don't care how much I have in common with people that are part of that historic movement that was added to the church by the Lord himself. 
not because I read the right history books, but because I obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. And because of that, I'm a Christian. And I want others to be Christians also. And I want them to come out from the ungodliness which is characterized in books like... Thank you. You know that's our shit don't you? <laughs> I, I really don't know why Jeff would want to breathe air that he can't, can't see. But there's, uh, you know, I think that uh, these people that you have uh, so aptly described may in fact have some things in common with some of the uh, lower primates. <clears throat> what does an idiot look like anyway? I think they have a lot in common with that. Well, yes, yeah, sir. The bread is not like the dog food that uh, the state made a couple of weeks on the other side of the fence. The only reason you get it on the plant ship from the magazine is because it's not the kind of stuff we've been talking about all along. Well, what he uh, said was that uh, there have been some that said that the only reason that he's on the lift ship is because his mother and, and daddy are here. And I don't know how anybody comes to a conclusion on the basis of what they've heard here today. Uh, you know, uh, Paul, in, in, uh, uh, during his time in Athens, was accused by the Epicureans and still being a battler. Well, he... He, to him, to, to them, he was a babbler because he, he spoke uh, the truth. He presented things in a logical fashion, things that they could not comprehend. And I think what we are hearing from that comment is that there are those true babblers that uh, cannot consider the evidence and come to a proper conclusion. Uh, Paul said that there would be some who will not in, endure sound doctrine because, you know, they have their own desires. Uh, they are substituting their desires for the uh, desire of our Lord and Savior. In order to accomplish the end, their ends, they have to heap to themselves their own teachers because they're not going to live somebody like, like uh, Jeff. And uh, they're going to give, not give heed to the truth, but they're going to give heed to fables. And Paul says elsewhere they'll give uh, heed to fables and... Fables become the commandments of men, and they're giving heed to that. And uh, he said that they're going to give heed to uh, deceiving spirits, and the deceiving spirits are embodied in the uh, uh, corpus of uh, man, in the presence of man. Men are those deceiving spirits, and they are going to be teaching the doctrines of uh, their toxic law. I mean demons. <clears throat> and you might be surprised that these sorts of individuals will actually speak as in hypocrisy, portraying themselves as Satan was described as an angel of light, when in fact they're, they're angels all right, but they're angels of uh, devils. So, uh, Jeff... I know that you're going to be terribly upset that some have made that comment about you and you may not be able tonight. Uh, but I want you to know, uh, be comfortable with the fact that we have every confidence in you. And, uh, I, you know, um, your mother said that if we didn't have you that she would be terribly upset. <laughs> but we, we don't pay attention to her anyway, so... <laughs> Neither, neither does James. <laughs> but we are, uh, you know, the, the, it's important for us to to examine these uh, these books like this because we and they that could have the, the things that he has uh, spoken of that uh, actually is uh, taught in his book. It's already in the church. It's in the church. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, so you, know, you did a. I don't think anybody could have done a better job of uh, reviewing that book and you have done and, and we're going to continue to have you because your love for the truth and starting 
and uh, your detractors to the contrary, they just don't know you as we know you. They listen to you. The conclusion that we already uh, hold, but if they can't come to that conclusion, that's just their their problem, not ours. And you don't have to put me in hell. What's that? And you don't have to put me in hell. That's right. We don't have to do that. <laughs> Money was never a consideration to me, though. So, I, you know, <laughs> just probably save a buck, you know, and I never get a get a thought. Hey, of course, this this is our lunch hour. We uh, do have uh, lunch prepared in the back. We all to stay for that. Uh, it's not going to be a, a sumptuous fare, but it will be adequate. So we invite you all to stay for that. I'm going to a prayer, and uh, during that prayer I will offer thanks for the food. And uh, uh, again, we'll reconvene here at uh, one.